Hello everybody. Welcome to uh, this second edition of the Introduction to the Bible. We welcome you this afternoon. It should be uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, we've got some uh, some interesting things to go over today. So we welcome you today. If you have uh, some questions you want to ask, if you have some uh just want to get involved in this we welcome you uh, so if you are um, if you're here uh, give me a comment real quick I want to see if I can if I can participate in this um, with you today let's see here I'm using a different method today to do this I'm, I'm using a little bit of different technology than I used last week so so bear, bear with me as I learn these things today. Also, uh, have some uh, some allergies today, so I want to apologize for that. Looks like we got a couple of people watching right now, and uh, if you want to ask a question, um, go ahead and um, let us know what questions you have today, and we're going to get started. So. A little bit of a, of a review from last week. Um, I introduced you to a book uh, called um, 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. Now, this is going to be backwards. I know. I'm sorry. 30 Days to Understanding the Bible by Max Anders. I used this book when I was a student at Stephen F. Austin State University in a local church there called Grace Bible Church. We did a Bible study called uh, 30 Days to Understanding the Bible uh, with Max Anders, and it was there um, th during this Bible study that we uh, talked about a certain thing. I want to show you on my screen. So I'm using some screen share today, so bear with me. Um, we're going to well, it doesn't look like I can I can do that <laughs> today. So, well, you never know with uh, technology these days. But we talked about last week the uh, timeline of the Old Testament. We talked about the the three different sections of the Old Testament: your history, uh, the poetry, and the prophecy sections of the Old Testament. We then went into the nine major divisions of the Old Testament. The nine main eras of the Old Testament. Uh, we talked about creation and we talked about the patriarchs. And um, today we're going to wrap up that discussion on the patriarchs. And we're also going to hopefully dip into the Exodus story uh, involving Moses and the Hebrew people being um, finding their exodus from slavery in Egypt. So today, as we as we dip into the patriarchs today, uh, last week we talked about Abraham. So this week we're going to talk about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. So that's where we're going to pick up today. Now, if you look in your Bibles on uh, in Genesis in chapter. 20, uh, let's go actually, yeah, at, uh, chapter 24 is really when the story of Isaac uh, picks up. Now before this, you're going to have, um, yes, the testing of Abraham is an Isaac story, but it's more of an Abrahamic story. So today we're going to pick up uh, with the story of Isaac and Rebecca. And so Abraham sends his his uh, chief servant to uh, his his household. And so there his servant is going back to the the Ur territory and there he's going to find a a, a wife for Abraham's son Isaac. Now there's this motif in Hebrew literature, one that I want to uh, to share with you today, that um, 
is not really talked about very often, uh, but it is it's this motif that happens with with Isaac. It also happens with Jacob, and then it happens with with Jesus, and that is the meeting of a woman at a well. So here, um, with Abraham's chief servant goes to find a wife for Abraham's son. The servant meets um, meets Rebecca at a well, and so there's this motif in the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible about um, the the woman being found or discovered at the well and offered an opportunity to be part of something larger um, than herself. So the first piece of this is Isaac and Rebecca. And so the story of Isaac and Rebecca and uh, this well story is it's a beautiful story. It happens in chapter 24 of Genesis. Now, immediately following that, you have the death of Abraham. And, and then in your Bibles in uh, chapter 25, you're going to also see that there's then the story of, of Ishmael's sons and also um, Jake, the story of Jacob and Esau being born. So these two twins are being born um, and they're fighting in the womb. I mean, this is this is going to be something that is is going to be happening for a long time for them in their lives. They're always going to be going head to head. They're always going to be uh, arguing, bickering, uh, fighting about who's the best and and this and that. And it even started before they were born. And so Esau, uh, who was actually the first to be born the first of the twins, uh, he was a, he was a man's man. He was one that, that would go out and hunt. He liked to hang out with his dad. And so, um, so Jacob was one to, to stay around the house and to, to be close to his mother. So you have these two twins, Jacob and Esau, and they couldn't be more different than one another. They couldn't be. Uh, they couldn't be more. Uh, you know, you have Esau who wants to be with his dad, who wants to hunt, and then you've got Jacob who wants to be with his mom, and wants to stay in the home. Now, with this also becomes this favoritism piece uh, that is evident between Jacob and Esau. Is uh, is playing favorites, and so um, you have Esau is as the oldest is supposed to have the birthright and the blessing. But here, what happens in this story is that Jacob is going to take both the birthright and the blessing from Esau. And the first way he does it uh, is he knows that Esau uh, is going to come out of the field and he's going to come home. He's going to be famished. He's going to be extremely hungry. And so Jacob sets him up for this kind of a trap. And he says, well, yeah, you're, you're going to be hungry. And so how about... Instead of me just giving you something to eat, how about you give me something in return? And so uh, he makes this lentil soup and he says to his brother, he says, um, I'll, I'll give you some lentil soup for your, for your birthright. And his brother says, you got to be kidding me. That's, that's ridiculous. Well, Yes, it is. It is pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, but he says, what the heck? I'm, I'm hungry. I'm famished. If it's that important to you that you have my birthright, then 
then go ahead and take it. Now, this story of the birthright for the lentil soup, it's not one that's talked about a lot, but it's a very important story. And, and this is this is why it's it's important. And there's several layers to this. There's there's Joseph, or I'm sorry, Jacob tricking his brother for this birthright. And then there's also the disregard for the importance of the birthright uh, by Esau. And so Esau would would really just do anything for a meal, uh, something that he doesn't have to do or he doesn't even have to provide. And Jacob is working hard uh, not only to provide the meal, but also working hard because he knows the importance of this birthright. Now bring in also uh, the, the parents into this picture. Bring in... Um, Bring in Isaac and Rebecca. If if my brothers and I were were playing around uh, one day, and uh, and one of my brothers said to me, "Hey, I'll I'll cook you some spaghetti if you give me your inheritance," and I'd say to myself, "Well, that's pretty foolish. Why would I why would I even consider giving you my inheritance for some spaghetti?" But if I if I went with it, if I said, "What the heck, you know, I'll I'll give you my inheritance for some spaghetti." I think my brothers can cook spaghetti, by the way. Um, so it, it, yeah, I, I'll I'll just go with this. I'll I'm so hungry right now, and your spaghetti looks so delicious that I'll just I'll just give my inheritance to you for that. Now imagine. What the parents, I can only imagine what my parents would think if I, if I just said, hey, you know, I just gave my inheritance to my brother for, for some spaghetti. They would be pretty upset with me, wouldn't they? You, you did what? You, you gave your inheritance for some spaghetti? Don't you realize how important your inheritance is? Don't you realize how important it is that we we want to give you this gift? We want to celebrate our family in this. And and apparently it's not that important to you. You were willing to give it up for some spaghetti. So there's there's that piece of it. There's also the piece of why would my brother want my inheritance so bad that that he would even offer it on the table for some spaghetti so so yeah there's this piece in here between Jacob and Esau and what this does is it sets the precedence for the next story which is a common theme in and Hebrew literature is that if it happens to one person, it's going to happen to the next person. And so here we are, we're experiencing that now with uh, with Jacob and Esau. So what happens to one is going to happen to both. And uh, so let's let's move on to the to the next story because he he gets his his birthright. And then now he's going now he's going to get his blessing. So now we're in chapter 27 of the book of Genesis uh, and we're going to to see what happens here uh, when he gets his blessing. So you've got you've got it all set up. This is a I can just imagine this working out in a TV show or a play. You've got Jacob home with his mom and and Esau out in the field. And at this time, Isaac has gone blind. He cannot see anymore. But he knows what 
his sons, how his sons behave. He can tell them apart. Uh, yes, they're twins, but but Esau was, as we know in this uh, section, he was a hairy man. Um, and then you have Jacob, who's a homeboy, who wants to stay in the kitchen with his mom. And so the stage is set, and the mom says, hey, we have an opportunity here. Um, your father... It, he, your father is blind. He can be tricked pretty easily. And so they go through with this plan. <clears throat> so instead of Esau going into the field and getting his, his kill and coming it back and cleaning it, the mother plays this game now because Joseph or Jacob is so important to her as as her favorite son she wants him to have this blessing so they prepare a meal uh, Jacob disguises himself as Esau and uh, and Isaac falls for the trap and I can see in this the there's a lot of emotion at the end of this story there's a there's a lot of emotion between Esau and his father. And then the, the trick that happens between Jacob and Esau, uh, it sets up the, the rest of this narrative between the two of them just, just always fighting and always battling for uh, for control and family rights. And so... I just want to read. Uh, I just want to read out of my Bible uh, a little bit of, of the end of this. Uh, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, "My father, sit up and eat some of my game, so you may give me your blessing." His father Isaac asked him, "Who are you?" I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently. He realized that he had been tricked. He, he trembles violently. And he says, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came. And I blessed him. Indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud cry and said to his father, Bless me too, father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? because he has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Jacob, or Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you. I have made all of his relatives his servants. And I have made, I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So now, what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father answered him, Your dwelling will be with me will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But you will grow restless. You will throw his yoke fr from off your neck. I can just imagine and I can just sense and feel in this piece the emotions between Esau and Isaac. I can only imagine the 
the pain and suffering that he feels knowing that his brother has tricked him. The sobbing, the grief, the, the despair. And to think that his father loved him so much, yet he didn't have another blessing. From this point on in, in the story, we we see that, that Jacob and Esau are are distancing themselves from from one another. And, and in fact, Jacob now flees to his uncle's house, uh, which is where he's going to meet um, he's going to meet Rachel and uh, he's going to meet Leah and he's going to uh, be deceived now. He's going to be deceived by his uncle. So a deceiver is now going to be deceived by uh, Laban. And so on his way uh, to Laban's house, he stops at this place and he, he, uh, he's going to, to rest for the night. And this is when we see the, uh, the wonderful story of the, the ladder. <clears throat> so Jacob reaches a certain place. He stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taken one of the stones there, he put it under his head, and he lays down to sleep. He has a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And angels of the Lord were ascending and descending on it. There above stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. And I will give your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out the west and to the east or the north and to the south. All the people on earth will be blessed through your offspring. I am, I am with you. I will watch over you. Where you go... I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. So when Jacob woke up from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone. He had been placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar to God. He poured oil on top of it and he called the place Bethel, which means house of God. And so it is that Bethel, the house of God, the dwelling place of God will become the promised land for the Israelites. So Jacob then arrives at Laban's house and he is then tricked by Laban. And he is tricked because uh, Laban has two daughters. He has Rachel and Leah. And it is Rachel who is the one that Jacob favors. And so Jacob makes a deal with Laban. He says, I, I will work with you for, for seven years. If I work for you for these, this long, then make a promise to me that I, I can marry your daughter Rachel. And so he works that time and and he is uh Laban sends his daughter to Jacob's tent and there they 
consummate their marriage and it turns out that it's not Rachel at all. It's actually the other daughter, Leah. Now imagine the surprise when he finds out, well, this isn't even Leah or this isn't even Rachel. This, is, this isn't the right one. And so he tells Laban, he says, you, you tricked me. And Laban said, I didn't trick you. I said, you can work for seven years for my daughter. Now you're going to have to work another seven years for the one you, the one you wanted to marry. And so he does. Uh, he lets uh, Laban uh, ends up tricking him. And uh, they end up, um, he works for another seven years. And he and Rachel get married as well. So now he has two wives. He has Rachel and Leah. And it is, uh, it is, it is Rachel who he truly loves. But the interesting thing is that it's not Rachel who's able to have children. It is Leah. And so Leah is, um, able to have several children and, and in fact uh, Leah has um, has six children uh, well six sons uh, she actually has seven children for Jacob the first son of Leah is Reuben and then si uh, Simeon uh, and then Levi and then Judah so she has Jacob's first four children. And then uh, Rachel becomes uh, jealous of uh, Leah's ability to have children. And although Rachel cannot have children, uh, she decides to offer her maidservant to Jacob. And so um, Bilhah um, has the next two sons of Jacob, which are uh, Dan and Nephtali, are born of uh, Bilhah, which is Rachel's maidservant. And so uh, then Leah says, well, I, I might not be, have, be able to have any more children uh, myself, but I do have a maidservant just like Rachel does. And so Leah offers her maidservant to Jacob, and uh, so Leah's maidservant uh, Zilpah uh, gives birth to Gad and Asher. So uh, we now have uh, eight sons of Jacob, and then uh, Leah finds out that she can have more children, and so she gives birth to uh, Isaacar and also to uh, Jacob, the ninth and tenth sons of uh, of Jacob, and so then, um, so then you also have you have um, Rachel is then able to have children, and she has Joseph as her firstborn son, and then she also has. Um, she also has Benjamin, who is the youngest of the two sons. Uh, so if you look there at um, the sons of Jacob, Jacob has actually has, um, I'm pulling up my list here, six sons uh, through Leah. But the one, the wife that he loved the most, Rachel, is has his two youngest sons Joseph and Benjamin, and so um, yes, you have these are the uh, the twelve sons of Jacob, and so we know that that the sons of Jacob are also going to be the twelve tribes of Jacob, but there's not a tribe called Joseph. And in fact, there's not even a, uh, a tribe of Levi. So Joseph and Levi are not given tribal names uh, when they settle in the land of Israel 
But in fact, what happens is the Levites become the priests and the priests live in all of the different 12 tribes. There's priests residing in all the, all the 12 territories belonging to the 12 tribes. And then Joseph's two sons, uh, there's, the two tribes are named after his two sons. So uh, Joseph is kind of given more, more honor in this, even though his name is not given as a tribal name. His two sons are given tribal names and territories in the promised land. So I'm going to make a shift here now as we have spoken of, of Jacob and, and Esau. We're going to go ahead and make this shift here now uh, to the last of the major patriarchs, and that being uh, the patriarch Joseph. So uh, the story of, of Joseph really begins uh, in chapter 37 of the book of Genesis. And it is here where we realize that that Joseph has the ability uh, to understand dreams. Joseph himself is a dreamer, and Joseph is a dream interpreter. And so uh, here we see that Joseph has the ability to have these powerful dreams, but he's also given the ability to interpret the dreams. So uh, let's let's see here uh, the first dream that Joseph has is the one that really causes his brothers to hate him. And then not only that, but but Joseph has the audacity to share his dream with his brothers. And his, and his parents as well. So, so here Joseph has this dream uh, that the sun and the moon, which are his father and his mother, and all of the stars are going to bow down to him. Now, the interesting thing is that, that this dream of Joseph's um, actually does become a, a reality. This dream of Joseph's is actually uh, going to come to fruition, um, although his brothers can't believe it, him being uh, one of the youngest of all the brothers. And, and not only that, but but Joseph is, um, he is a favorite of his father's. He is the oldest of Rachel. But his brothers hate him for that. And so although Joseph does receive this coat of vibrant colors from his father, uh, because he is one of his father's beloved sons, his brother's hatred for him boils to the point where, where Joseph is, um, is going to be attacked by his brothers. And he's going to be sold as a slave uh, in Egypt. And so Joseph is sold as a slave. He works for a man named Potiphar and is there in Potiphar's house where, where there, is, there is more deception that's going to happen. I tell you what, the book of Genesis, these, the 50 chapters of the book of Genesis just never get old. And if you haven't ever read Genesis from the beginning to the end. There's so much vivid storytelling here. And so Joseph is working for uh, for Potiphar and um, he's doing quite well for himself. But but Potiphar's wife wants to have an affair with Joseph. And Joseph, being a man of God, he will not consent to this. Um, and so he is tricked by Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife 
uh, because Joseph would not have an affair with her, um, Potiphar's wife tells Potiphar that he tried to have an affair with her, that he tried to, 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 um, to abuse her. And so Potiphar, of course, is going to believe his wife. And so now Joseph, even though he did nothing wrong, the accusations were there. And Joseph is now uh, thrown in prison. And it is in prison that Joseph begins, uh, he's at this low point in his life, becomes well known in prison that Joseph is a dream interpreter. Uh, and so Pharaoh ends up having a dream in which he cannot understand. There's these fat cows and these lean cows, and he can't understand the dream. And so they send for Joseph in prison and ask him to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And it is then uh, that Joseph is able to share with Pharaoh the interpretation of his dreams, meaning that there is going to be a famine in the land. After a season of harvest, there's going to be a season of famine. And so um, they end up storing up grain and wheat, Israel, uh, the Egyptians do. They build these storehouses, and then so these, these years of harvest, they're going to receive all of the grain from these years of harvest, and they're going to store them up. They're going to put them in the storehouse so that when the years of famine come, they will have more than enough food. And so um, what ends up happening is that Pharaoh gives Joseph the position of second in charge of, of all of Egypt because of his ability to interpret this dream. So there Joseph is, uh, is in charge of storing the grain. He is in charge of being sure that they are prepared for the famine. And then not only that, but when the famine hits, Joseph is in charge of distributing the goods to the people. So when the famine hits, Jacob's family, all of Joseph's brothers, are without, without food. And so they have to go into Egypt now and they have to purchase food. And so when they get to Egypt, um, they don't notice Joseph at first because, number one, they haven't seen him in so long. Number two, as an Egyptian, he might have been in some kind of disguise. Um, as leadership with the Egyptians, he might have been wearing a headdress or he might have been wearing makeup or who knows why they didn't see, know him or understand who he was at first. But Joseph knew who his brothers were. And so uh, Joseph forgives his brothers for their wrongdoing against him. And here in this scene, you have the prophecy fulfillment from Joseph's original dream that the sun and the moon and the stars would bow down to him. And so Joseph uh, gets his brothers to bring Jacob uh, to Egypt. And so the Israelites end up settling in Egypt for the purposes of living there under the reign of that, that Pharaoh with Joseph as second in charge of all of Egypt. The Israelites are given then 
a territory within Egypt uh, to call their own and to participate in the harvest that they had received before the famine. And so the original intent of the Israelites being there in Egypt is because Joseph has brought his family there. Uh, as second in charge of all of Egypt, Joseph is now going to care for his father Jacob and his family. And he's going to provide the Israelites with, with plenty of, of food to eat. And there uh, they will be taken care of. And so next week when we enter the story of, of Exodus, we're going to see that the reason that the Israelites are even in Egypt in the first place is so that so that they will be able to to have this blessing of Joseph's leadership that the family will be taken care of that the family will be secured and as you read into the first chapter of Exodus it explains very clearly that a new pharaoh rose up and the new pharaoh did not know of Joseph nor did he like the Israelites living in Egypt and so he decides to enslave them and to make them do his work and so that is why uh, we next week we'll look at the Exodus story and I hope you'll join me for that. Uh, before we leave today, I, I do want to uh, make a reference of another book uh, to you. I want to refer you to uh, this book this week. It's called Making Sense of the Bible. Uh, it's probably backwards on your screen uh, by a man named Adam Hamilton. And Adam Hamilton is a United Methodist pastor in Leewood, Kansas, uh, the, one of the largest United Methodist churches in the world, uh, Church of the Resurrection. And the reason I want to recommend this book, especially, I mean, he is a fantastic writer. But there's a chapter in this book. Uh, it is uh, chapter 3 when he talks about the Old Testament. And he goes, he does an outline and an overview of, of the the entire Old Testament in a matter of uh, 15 minutes. Well, that's actually what the chapter is called, uh, the Old Testament in 15 minutes. And so uh, I recommend this book to you, uh, Adam Hamilton, Making Sense of the Bible. It is a good read, and there's also uh, a Bible study uh, tools to go along with it as well as you just, if you ever decide to do it as a group study, uh, you might enjoy that as well. Um, so now, as we leave today, I want to encourage you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>